Hello Computer. This is Hello Computer, a series of interviews carried out in 2023 at a time when artificial intelligence appears to be going everywhere all at once. Our next interview is with Jonas Iverson of the University of Gothenburg in Sweden. My name is Jonas Iverson. I am a professor of informatics and uh, I do research connected to uh, humans and AI and how they relate to each other. And my background is actually coming from cognitive science uh, communication studies. I had a long sort of uh, time where I worked in education, uh, became a professor of education, but I, um, I was always working with technologies and like more advanced forms of knowledge. So higher education, design practices, architecture, was interested in medicine and uh, yeah. So a few years ago, mm, I, I had this sort of feeling that AI was going to explode. Uh, so I, I get, went back to my uh, previous uh, studies from cognitive science and, and refreshed my understanding of AI. Uh, and and in that sort of the consequences of that was that I moved to another department and uh, so now I'm in this field of uh, like human centered AI research. You have been doing this for for longer than some other people have been doing this. You've been active in this area for for a while, haven't you? So you must have seen quite a pace of change over the last few years. Is that the sense that you've had that the pace of change has been has been more intense recently? The large language models and so on has been on my radar for for quite a while, but uh, I think the last the last year it exploded, especially within uh, how it's been reported on in media and and how it came to everyone's awareness. But also, I think the pace of change within those uh, fields seem also to be uh, accelerating with uh, uh, the different versions of like, for instance, uh, GPT from three to three point five with ChatGPT, and then what it can do now with four. And it's like only a few months in between. I think that is, uh, we will see a lot happening with with the new versions and, and also how things are going to build as chains of such systems and so on. One of the things that hit the headlines um, a couple of years ago, perhaps before the large language model explosion that we've seen more recently, is deep fakes and deep fake videos. And you yourself produced uh, a, d- a deep fake video. Can you tell us, you know, what what was the reasoning behind that? Why did you do it, and what was the response? Yeah, well, I was interested to see, I mean, how it, how it can be done, but also the perception of that and what colors, what what is it that uh, goes into uh, perceiving something like a deep fake? Um, so, of course, if you have a politician or someone in in this, that kind of position, it, you can suspect that there could be deep fakes, and and it's it's all it's been done around like the Obama and and, and so on um, but uh, I wanted to know uh, how to do it and I, I developed this uh, uh, or I built a deep fake of myself using not research tools or uh, tools that uh, you had to tinker with yourself but rather things that were available as services uh, on the market uh, and there were a couple of technologies one for the voice and one for the the face uh, but Basically, recording uh, voice samples and some video samples of myself. I sent it into the services. They trained the system, and then with the simple API call, I could connect them together and and just produce, put in text, uh, and then get a lecture type of uh, output from uh, me re yeah reading this uh, or talking to the camera. On this uh, so the 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 idea was to see what was available this is a year and a half ago perhaps and uh, but also to put it out there in uh, because i've done a few videos uh lecturing on on small topics and so on so i put it in that format uh sent it out to my networks and and colleagues to see if, what the reactions would be because uh obviously i can hear there's a problem with the voice quality and uh and also there's some stiffness to it but there was no no reaction uh on on uh, behalf of all my friends and colleagues and and family and saying that okay now you've done a, a fake so i i put up a second video like disclosing everything like quickly after uh, and showing okay so this is how it's done this wasn't a case of you trying to fool people for fun this was you carrying out an experiment 
to see um, who would be taken in by it and um, also to see, I guess, well, let's talk about it, trust. This was an experiment in trust, is that right? Yeah, it d depends on how we define trust, but one uh, one idea that I work with uh, in understanding trust is that it's uh, trust is this expectation that things will uh, be as we we think it will be like we can rely on each other we can uh things are going to be as be normal uh so trust is that kind of relationship and uh that's usually how we perceive things we trust uh we we act on uh the interactions and uh when i send put up a video people will expect that it's me on the video and with that kind of expectation you can um disregard or ignore or sort of even if there are some disfluencies some problems with that material that attitude of, of trust will sort of make the material understandable as being coming from me being me uh and that's uh, something i've tried to explore further on now and looking at other materials what will happen when we start to have these uh these technologies like uh, being replacing perhaps some of these interactions uh can we maintain that attitude of trust or will it be uh will that have to change uh, uh, but what have you found let, let, let's go straight to the results then Do, what what are the hopes for humanity then can trust survive the ai revolution i think it depends on on the uh how much use we will see of these technologies like voice agents like uh versions of deep fakes that could be um uh that could be coming out uh because one of the findings in uh like a recent study was that when uh when you see that this is possible when people understand that uh these technologies can trick you uh, because you can't, uh, the, the the voice perhaps is so so good you might enter into this uh interaction or reading or viewing of the material as with the uh, kind of suspicion uh with a suspicious mind and then uh that itself has implications for how you interpret uh whatever it is you see or hear uh and then we we found that there are examples where people have this idea that okay so this material coming from google duplex service is going to be using a robot so we can see in the details of the talk how it is a robot we can find the pauses there we can find the hesitations that really show the sort of the technical sort of the technical system uh, not working perfectly uh and then in the, in some cases it's been revealed that but those uh those uh, recordings were not done by a, a technical system or an ai it was a human uh so it's it's not in the materials themselves now it's it's very much in the attitude and this uh yeah, how you enter into, how you read and interpret. So we we try to figure out what is it, uh, how can we explain this, like more theoretically. You've said that you know, the, the opposite of trust is suspicion, and and I guess um, you know what we're saying here then is that people are already suspicious. So if they're if they're saying I've called this, this is an AI, when in actual fact it's humans. I mean. That that sounds like we're already in a great deal of of of, of problems, a great deal of trouble. Um, trying to work out, you know, what is real and what isn't real. You yourself have said that maybe in the future people will suspect every video that you do to be a deep fake because you carried out that first experiment. I uh, haven't encountered that yet, but yes, people do make jokes about whenever I appear somewhere that it's like might not be me and. Uh, so they know I, I am uh, working with this and, and maybe playing around with the, the possibilities. So I don't think it's yet become a major problem, but it might be. And and uh, I think uh, because this mistreating someone, uh, some human ass, if it were they were technology, I think that is a very yeah obviously dehumanizing attitude or relationship. And uh, and but you you will do that without yeah uh without knowing uh so how how can we steer clear of that development i think it's partly by being very explicit about when we use technologies and when we are humans on the other end 
Uh, and that's not impossible to do. It's more of a design decision. Uh, we c- and I think we can interact with uh, digital technologies like voice agents or, or avatars, whatever, without trouble. It's like we, we might prefer that in some instances. I might book a table, like a table at a restaurant or uh, a hotel or something like that. If I know I'm now interacting with an agent, yeah, that's fine. That's not a problem. That's gonna not going to be uh, like have big consequences. But it's more when when these service providers try to mask what it is we are interacting with. Like maybe they want to uh, have you think that it's human, but it's not. Or or maybe they want you to think it is an agent, but they sometimes want to draw on the resources of a human. So then there are some uh, I think technical reasons or. For, for wanting this to be obscure. But that, I think, is a danger. We, we see that develop. This is legitimate users of uh, AI agents um, perhaps require transparency, more transparency, more more um, signaling that this is a, an AI agent rather than them trying to fool us that it's a real person because we're already suspecting that everybody that we're talking to now digitally may be an AI. So is that what we're saying, that people need... That the legitimate users need to be more transparent about when it is an AI. Is that right? Yeah, that's my position. I think that that's definitely the case. We uh, we should have that kind of signaling. It could be done in different ways, like with the it could be disclosed at the opening of of a conversation. But it could also be like you, know, you could make a signal if it's a voice agent. You can have a signal continuous, like make that voice hearably uh, synthetic. Uh, and that's easy to do, but you and you don't have to make them like speak badly or in in like not being competent speakers. But it can still you can understand like hear constantly that now and uh, this is a synthetic voice. Where does the uncanny valley um, fit into all of this? Um, please tell us about that. This is something that was such the the notion of the uncanny valley from uh, Professor Mori came up in the 70s and, and it's more to do with robot design, uh, like how you would design a robot. And and yeah, it's been discovered that the more human-like you, it becomes, sort of, it, it's okay for a while, but then it's sort of, it, it said that it reaches this uh, peak where it's sort of, you're, you go down the uncanny valley and you feel, you get an emotional response to to these, uh, these figures that l- resemble humans, but there is something strange about that. So I've, I've looked at the, the literature itself is is older, and there is a discussion by uh, by Jentsch and, and some psychologists, Jentsch and uh, also Freud, of course, uh, and they speak a lot about the the unknown in a way, how that produces these feelings. But the notion with the uncanny valley is sort of it also builds on this uh, other idea that when you then get closer and closer to to real uh, real life, uh, the uh, this valley, you sort of you you can cross that, and and then it becomes perfect again, and and uh, and we're really happy to have these interactions with uh, super uh, realistic looking uh, robots, like, like looking like human. I'm not so sure about that. That's never been proven, and uh, uh, yeah, that in a way remains to be seen uh, what happens. I I've been taking more of a. Uh, like a sociological uh, perspective on this issue, uh, trying to understand not uh, sort of what is the, the face of some some robot looks like, but more sort of what kind of uh, interactions do we have? How can we relate to these entities? Uh, and there, it uh, I think it's more problematic, less re- uh, reasonable to think that we will have uh, forming close relationships that. Um, one of the notions one can can draw on is uh, uh, also we can talk about the sort of reciprocity of perspectives. It's an idea from sociology that you you can change positions with another human, and uh, you would basically know what it is uh, to sit in 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 that other person's uh, position, what the world will look like from a slightly different angle, and and what your feelings might be and and so on. It's not perfect, but it's like you you have a, a basic sense of what it is to be a human with a body and 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 to 
to be in this world. And from that uh, position or from that reciprocity, that's how we try to understand each other and, and, and build understanding as a, some kind of collaborative enterprise and understanding is sort of developed gradually as we move, move through an interaction. So the, then the question is, okay, so if we do the similar thing uh, with uh, an AI agent, uh, what kind of understanding can there be between us? Uh, definitely there is one form where if I ask a question and I get a response that sort of show me that the question was heard and understood, like you get appropriate response, there is a sense of that demonstration of understanding and, 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 and so on. Uh, and I, I believe that these, uh, the new large language models really show that uh, quite a lot. There is a great deal of uh, like interactive understanding in the sense of uh, them providing reasonable responses, drawing the right conclusions from what I think and, and so on. Uh, but then there is the other thing, the, the notion of can we switch positions? Can we uh, do, does this uh, agent have the perspective that I, are, that I have on, on things? And there I think that's so far from, from true. Uh, and, and it's my belief that we, we need this as well uh, for, for us to, to form some kind of relationship. And uh, I, I, it's not missed from the discussion, but it's like uh, it's a, a bit uh, overlooked, this, uh, uh, this idea of uh, what we characterize as, uh, as thinking human beings, feeling feelings and so on, take uh, a great deal in this. So it's um, the, then the sort of the, coming back to the uncanny valley. I'm not sure, but it's uh, once we get these very competent uh, interactive partners that appears to be understanding us, appears to interact with us in perfect ways, but there is this other sense of that they are completely alien. Uh, there is some. Uh, I, I think that can arouse a lot of uh, uneasiness and uncanniness. Uh, that it's like interacting with a ghost or with a like mystical creature or somehow it's like. Uh, so I think that uh, these concepts from like uh, uh, from way back of, of magic and that that could be perhaps a, a way to 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 understand or to to, to talk about these new feelings of. Uh, uh, of AI uh, in the future, not that they are magic, but that that, that it provokes that kind of sense of uh, sort of not knowing how we, uh, yeah, uh, what we need to do in order to please these uh, entities, or uh, that they might interact in unexpected ways, and uh, sort of yeah. very fascinating, very fascinating. The idea that magic has a valid position in science in 2023, in order for us to to perhaps process a, a greater challenge. That's that's incredible. Uh, so we're talking about how the uncanny uh, myths and the uncanny valley is uh, is being revised as we speak. The Turing test as well. What that that is also that must be going through all sorts of changes of perception at the moment. What's your take on the Turing test? Yeah, one uh, one could say that the Turing test is, is sort of constructed as. Uh, Built on the game, uh, uh, the parlor game, and it, so in a way, it's, what it's doing is actually uh, operating with deception as its basic premise. Um, but also, it, th there is one conceptual critique of the Turing class that it sort of it hides the thing that we we deem so important, like this uh, uh, that whether or not it's human. Uh, for us, it's very important to to know know that aspect in order to ascribe cognition or ascribe uh, understanding. Uh, so we are so the, the Turing test is just asking for the output for the performance of the of the system. So say that we should evaluate thinking based on that. Uh, and I think there is uh, there are some um, some problems with that. Uh, because it's that's not how we go about doing things in uh, ordinary life. Uh, 
And also in one way, we could say that the Turing test has sort of, uh, now we can't really decide. I mean, based on it can be, it's sort of all game over <laughs> for it as an experiment, but rather it has, why could they moved out into the wild now? So people are doing the Turing test like constantly and it's like trying to figure out, uh, is this human or is this an AI? So it's, uh, it's escaped the laboratories. Now it's, uh, yeah. It's out there. So we've we've talked about how um, legitimate uses of AI um, are developing and how perhaps they need some more transparency. But what about the the criminal and the uh, the, the bad ca- the, the, the the bad actor uses of AI? Um, what can we expect there? Well, you've talked about scenarios with scammers um, using AI agents. Can you take us through one of those scenarios, please? That's going to be a really difficult challenge because these, uh, uh, when you have bad actors, it's uh, like regulation doesn't really help. On a bigger level, it's been discussed whether or not we should stop the development. It should be, yeah, how it can be regulated and so on. And there are some comparisons with like biological weapons and so forth, uh, where there was like an, uh, like some successful uh, uh, regulation put in place. Uh, but I think put this uh, this time around, the, the technology is so uh, spread out. It's done by many different actors, and there are so many like legitimate use cases for it. So it's going to be so hard to uh, to control in that way. Uh, and therefore, I think a lot of things going to be developed, maybe with ethical constraints and and uh, guardrails and so on, but. It's still being on the market and being able, you can download these uh, um, these softwares or uh, and and re-de- repurpose them. So I think that we are going to see other kinds of scams and and uh, malicious use of of them. Of course, um, I know that some uh, like voice cloning has been used in uh, in in US and other countries to uh, to do like. Uh, to pretend that uh, a child has been uh, kidnapped, for instance, and you hear the uh, the child child's voice, and then uh, someone uh, saying that they they want money or so to release them. Uh, and of course, like you, you come really close to someone when you you can hear, like maybe you can produce a, the scared voice of, of someone you know, and of course the reaction is going to be very emotional uh, and not to be uh, rational thinking maybe this is fake and so on. So uh, once these uh, technologies can hit you like very to get a very personal relationship, I think that could be uh, uh, put to to misuse very easily. Uh, It's hard to know the scale of this. And and as it sort of develops, maybe there will be more reports about that and and people's awareness are going to be raised. So. yeah, uh, but I, I think it's it's going to be very hard to control. It's like from from the start. It's uh, maybe you have to find ways uh, uh, as these cases come, crop up. Yeah. Is this the government's responsibility, or is it the individual's responsibility? Is it the tech company's responsibility? Where and who needs to take action, and are they taking action? Uh, I think it's. Uh, like a very much a shared responsibility because it's uh it's hard to put one actor or one uh, organization uh, in charge of this development since it's happening across a range of uh like academia and industry and and so on so the development happens um uh, broadly even though there are some very big players on on uh, mm-hmm. out there so of course and and I guess the bigger you are, the more responsibility you also have to take and in, in, in what you're uh, putting out uh, on the market. I'm not sure. I mean, there are different initiatives happening. I'm not fully like uh, uh, in control of like understanding what uh, uh, all sort of the range of all of that. Like. Uh, I think the EU initiative of, of differentiating different levels of yeah. sort of possible harm is one way that could be it's it's good to uh, 
to to regulate then the in the details it's uh, of course it's going to be a lot of discussion so what is uh, uh what is in what category or not uh, and also on the level of like what should be really should be put some bans on it. So I think the autonomous weapons kind of developments, that's uh, one of the areas that are truly scary. And uh, uh, yeah, but that, there you have like, there I think governments uh, should be regulating uh, and, and coming to agreements on that. It's not that you have uh, small actors working in that area. So it's like, <laughs> uh, up for the government, sir. So th th let's talk about existential threat then, because it it's not something that we want to uh, 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 minimize in these conversations, in these interviews. It's not something that we want to trivial uh, uh, trivialize. Um, but what are some of the existential threats that you can see if we don't address some of these issues? You've said about autonomous weapons there, and there are lots of other people that share that concern. But you also... A, a very um, involved in this, this, the psychology and the society side of things. So, and you've set, you've talked about you know new uh, new suspicions and new interactions being introduced into society. You know, what other existential threats can you see coming down the line? I've been working a lot with uh, technologies in relation to work and work practices. Uh, so the uh, how we how we have for many many. Uh, centuries used different technologies to like uh, get more powerful in in what we do, uh, and I think we see the same thing happening now with these these AI technologies, and they can leverage our powers uh, in 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 many ways. And in in the past few years, we've seen it in in areas we thought would not be hit as quickly, like the artistic ones and and creative uh, uh, areas. So there is a, a clear possibility that a lot of work will be displaced by this. Of course, there is always this uh, other question of there will be new kinds of positions to be had and, and we will do work in new ways and, and find ways. So there is like this balance between the things that disappear and the new things that come. Uh, and as we become more powerful in in uh in using them uh we can also make more for for less money so that's like there's a, a growing like abundance of uh, services that become available and and that we can afford as a as a population uh, but in that there is also this uh the question of resources that we make use of uh and so is that kind of growth sustainable uh which is a big question. I'm not sure. Uh, so, on, 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 on in relation to that, also the, the sort of the balance between uh, how many people will have that kind of work and how many people will find themselves without work, uh, because this could, I think, it could go very quickly. And if things go too quickly, you will have these societal upheavals, and that could trigger other events that we don't want. So. There is some uncertainty regard, regarding that. I think, in, uh, if these technologies become like not too powerful, but powerful enough to really change a lot of businesses, uh, uh, to so that they can make the yeah whatever they do in in uh, uh, in cheaper ways and and laying off big uh, chunks of people. I think that as a uh, we might see some really bad consequences of that and the sort of the political shifts that could come in in, uh, in the wake of those uh, uh, societal changes, uh, which often lead goes in and sort of more, uh, yeah, not so democratic. <laughs> yeah. It usually goes the other way, right? So uh, autocratic and uh, despotic uh, leaders will take over to, to sort of fix this problem and yeah are we going to see humans project or, or have genuine emotion onto ai then are, are, are humans going to fall in love are humans going to hate ai, AI in in a, in a sense that they love and hate other humans mm. yes i think so and i think uh, i mean but 
maybe more for uh, in marginal cases i think for like creating some relationship uh attaching emotion and and so on i mean it's possible in all sorts of configurations uh as it is and i think this uh these uh more powerful more uh realistic looking avatars you you will have uh people forming relationships there as well i think it's been explored in in, in good science fiction movies like her and the, the new blade runner movie is sort of show what that could look like and i i definitely think it's a possibility i don't think it will be the main uh uh main attraction for this but uh it's gonna happen uh because it's it's happened in the past and it's yeah that's gonna be continued sort of the hate i think is uh definitely true because it's sort of it's a response to uh to things that you don't know the unknown is uh or always fearful for some, and 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 hate might be uh, the first reaction to that. And so a lot of this is very philosophical, isn't it? Uh, yeah. yeah. Do, do you do you think that we as a society are philosophical enough, or are we just looking for TV dinners? You said about um, how AI is, uh, or give me convenience, or give me death. So you're a Dead Kennedys fan. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. And, and you tell us, tell us about te- well, tell us about that video as a convenience food. Yeah, when well, I mean, it was uh, like uh, a small idea that was done, uh, sort of communicated as a way to, I don't know, uh, uh, to sh- to use this deepfake uh, material. Uh, but the the basic idea is not very complicated. But it's like the idea of c- convenience as. Uh, something that we appreciate so much in in the modern society that things should be easy and should be uh yeah there for us to act whenever we want uh and of course that kennedy sort of criticized all of the consumerism in in uh, society and with uh, with that so it's, it's more like we have seen a, a great push towards videos uh on on social media and different platforms uh, but it's often very like uh, small snippets and uh, not going into longer conversations and so on. And this kind of uh, it's something that it's there for you to uh, consume whenever you want. It's really easy to access, and you can just uh, yeah close it whenever you want. So it's like uh, the idea that the, this convenience, that something that's very easy, it's also maybe very shallow. Uh, it's not a, like a quality signal. So if you want uh, more quality and maybe you have to, there has to be more assistance. Uh, so that's more that, that kind of idea that we, we've built this uh, uh, smorgasbord of small videos that we can access whenever we want. We can learn things, but it's it's not really engaging with what, what do I want for a long run? What is... Uh, how do I develop a new skill, perhaps? Um, how do I develop my thinking, which could take much more of a, a, a that it's more a struggle con, uh, connected to that. Uh, I think some people would quite rightly point out that TV dinners don't often offer the nutrition that that they should, um, and that if they did offer nutrition, that that's dependent on a commercial entity taking efforts to make sure that it is nutritious um but of course we don't think that we just eat the tv dinner don't we that we just do because we want the convenience um again it, it so this this sounds like another um thing that's cro- cropping up in conversation quite a lot where this isn't a government problem this isn't a um, a technological problem it's an individual problem and it's about the individual taking responsibility for themselves is that something that you believe i mean partly but it's also uh also con- not controlled by but it's influenced by i mean the, the 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 algorithms that uh give you the recommendations for whatever it is you're being served like uh so it's a, it's a combination of uh i i do believe in free will but it's uh <laughs> there's when it's also depending on what uh, 
uh, sort of within your reach, I would say. Uh, and uh, perhaps if it's too easy to get some parts, you will get distracted and, and go for that rather than go looking for yourself or what you're really interested in and, and what would make you more engaged on, on, in the long term. So that sounds like perhaps we are predictable mammals. We, we, we are predictable enough that those with money and power can absolutely influence us and that, yes, we might believe in free will and we might want free will, but the reality is that we're fooled every day. Is that correct? It's difficult to know. I mean, there is something in large numbers that I think is uh, uh, favoring the, these companies and that have all this information that you, it's, uh, it's, you just li need a little more, little advantage uh, so that you can uh, push the large mass in, in a certain direction. That's enough. So whether or not an individual is uh, going that way or not, it's, uh, I don't think we have the, it cannot be controlled on that level, but it's, uh, uh, with the right information, you can, you can still shift, uh, the ideas, uh, of, of, the of the population or a portion of the population. And that's, I think a, something that has not been available before in, in our history. And, and that could be, uh, yeah, it has been. Uh, I would say weaponized, and we've seen some effects of that. So, uh, it's it's hard to blame the, the individual for that kind of uh, control, but it's uh, definitely you you have to put up some resistance also. Absolutely. So, one, it, it's it's often difficult, I guess, to explain this to to the people. But one of the things that they may have seen whilst they're watching their videos and scrolling through their feeds is the um, the duck rabbit illusion. Um, if we say that, then I'm sure people go, oh yeah, the duck rabbit illusion. I get that. So can you take us through the duck rabbit illusion, please? Yeah, this is one thing we, we have used in uh, one of the studies or talk about the, the original uh, sort of illustration illusion is uh, was made by the Gestalt psychologists and uh, you have you have two ways to 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 watch this. Uh, either you see the the rabbit face of it, or or the duck face of it, and you can alternate between them once you know what you're looking at. Uh, and and the Gestalt psychologists were really trying to figure out why why was that the case and so on. And it was later picked up by uh, Ludwig Wittgenstein, philosopher, uh, and he he did something different with it. He he talks about what he calls uh, aspect aspect perception um first he says that when we look at this figure on like our ordinary perception uh we we see this say we see the rabbit face uh and when we discuss that we don't say that we see it as the rabbit we say that we see the rabbit it's like very the natural f relationship that we form to most objects in our surroundings and and but then he he talks about it when we begin to see the alternate sides, uh, then we describe this, there is like, we see the same thing, but we start to say that now I see it as uh, one part or as the rabbit or as the duck. Uh, and that's a different kind of perception, he says. So he calls that aspect perception that we, we can alternate. Uh, and his conclusion is that, that what we're doing then is like we're doing this conceptual uh, uh, it's a conceptual work that we're classifying it as either one thing or another. Uh, and this is a concept that we have brought them to these hearings uh, when we interact with robots and, and, and digital agents that you can either go in with this naive perception, go in with the trust uh, and just hear what you hear and, and take it for that. Um, or you can do that kind of uh, classification work, the suspicion. You can say that, or oh, maybe it's uh, it's a person, or maybe it's uh, a robot here. Uh, and that uh, that alternate hearing, that hearing with suspicion, uh, is a different kind of uh, perceptual activity. We would say. Um, so then the question is, what what uh, 
makes you then uh, sort of go into that mode rather than staying with the naive mode. And that's, uh, I think, for the future too, <laughs> we will see that more in the future. But uh, but as a uh, theoretical sort of uh, distinction, uh, we, we've used this uh, this easy duck rabbit uh, illustration to 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 make this point. Then people need to see the duck and the rabbit. <laughs> It everywhere in order to truly understand where they are in the system, I guess. And well, the, yeah, but the problem is that when you start to, to looking for the doubleness, like the you have the suspicion, then it's also problematic to act. Uh, so when you have when you're acting like uh, listening or hearing naively, you can act on that and you can continue. But when you have the suspicion there, when you work double, you don't. You have to decide. What should I do? Is it A or is it B? Uh, and it sort of it creates this obstacle to continuing and to to interacting. So it's if you have it all the time, you cannot really do anything. So you you're stopped in progress. And and so it's uh, uh it's difficult to to know when to sort of uh, to 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 have this approach and when it should be like relaxed. So the. Uh, I guess it's like a new psychological muscle that we all need to exercise. And until we all exercise it as a society, then it's going to be a lot of us practicing, I guess. Is that yeah, enough? Yeah, no, I think so. Subscribe to the Hello Computer channel here on YouTube to hear more interviews with experts as the world comes to terms with thinking machines.